Welcome to Strange Adventures everyone. If you want to learn about all the cool vampire and otherworldly and even mortal antagonists that you can use against your players, I thought that I would do a review or, and kind of chat about these two books. This one came out a while back and I sort of missed my opportunity window to talk about it exclusively, but recently the second Inquisition book has arrived and I thought it would be an appropriate time to talk about these because both of these books kind of act as uh, monster manuals for the Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition series of books and I think that they have a lot of cool and interesting stuff in them that I really want to share because giving your players things that they don't fully understand to fight against and perhaps confuse them with are, you know, just just really fun. If you're going for like a horror campaign, both of these books have really interesting scary stuff in them. They're not perfect and I'll, I'll tell you my uh, kind of caveats about what I think about each of these books, but overall the Sabbat book is scary because the entire thing is filled with different vampires that are driven to destroy things that even sometimes they don't fully understand. The antediluvians, the things that supposedly created each vampire bloodline, they rage against control of elders um, and sort of as an excuse to do terrible twisted things to mortals to other vampires and slowly become extremely powerful themselves through various alien philosophies and that's really fun you can uh, th this book provides a lot of really interesting variations on that theme but ultimately all of them are a death cult of vampire supremacists who really want to see the world burn in their own particular way and through their own particular means it's really fascinating and seeing how the sect of vampires has changed since previous editions is really cool because no longer are they kind of the vamp the 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 evil version of the Camarilla or the Anarchs or whatever they are their own thing in their very own unique position not always will you be able to talk to them to get your way out of a situation. They will play with you because they see themselves as apex predators. And it's really cool, uh, just all the different descriptions in here I very much enjoy. And uh, some people I've heard are un un unhappy, understandably, that in previous versions you could play as one of those monsters. and. I get that some people want to like really lean in, but in this edition of Sabat, I think they are more in line with actual unhinged, proper demonic style characters that don't really have any inner turmoil about the things they're doing. And when you as a player don't have second guesses about doing something unpleasant like murder, that, in my experience at the very least, leads to uncomfortable situations at the table. So I understand what they've done here, but if I'm gonna be perfectly honest, different paths as they are, if I'm gonna be honest, these are sort of laid out as you would in a, a player character like creation thing in the core rulebook. Like they list all the different paths. And it's cool because they reject the idea that vampires, or they in particular, come from any one bloodline and they all kind of uh, cultify and brainwash each other into internalizing the idea that clan is a horrible idea that just puts you in chains from the, the progenitors of these bloodlines, right? So uh, they supplement that with these paths. So if you want to make a character from a path, you can probably do it real easy. Uh, it won't take much twisting to, to, to give that a go. And that, I think, is a really good 
uh, overview of the Sabbat book. And more recently, the Second Inquisition book has arrived. And this is more of a political horror, a spy game that you can introduce into your campaign as kind of like a looming terror. This one hits a lot closer to home. It's got obviously a lot less supernatural, a lot less occult themes that you can pull from. Although it is in there, it's not as strong. I think this book is kind of scary in a, a surveillance state, police state, authoritarianism is everyone is like harvesting your information from your phone and the TikTok videos that you watch are building a psychological profile of you personally and they will use that against you to put you away and in the case of vampires burn your house down with you in it. Yeah it hits a lot closer to real world political and real world situations in in the second inquisition book here which is really cool if that's the kind of horror you're going from like for instance you could probably do a world war ii french resistance style campaign if that's like supplant that with uh, modern day ideas you could do a resistance campaign in some modern police states that's where i find a lot of the horror in this book Unfortunately, I don't think it goes quite far enough into the scary parts of this. There's a lot to be said about this book, and I'll go over that later in this video. But overall, I think this book is scary because the evil that exists is quite often faceless and will come for you without remorse. Now, where does that build in the drama? In both of these books, the drama comes from being able to observe the horrific things like a second inquisition raid on one of your enemies or your allies or being tailed or in Sabbat watching them tear down some sort of elder and eating them diablerie, having your blood stolen. Uh, them playing with you, playing with fire, and you know, like goading people in these rituals of self-flagellation, goading each other into like uh, jumping into fires and surviving, or trying to at least. And yeah, both of them build in drama. But obviously, from a t storytelling perspective, when you are trying to create tension for your players, often it's best to have a a chat with the enemy. They don't have to be able to convince each other of anything. They don't necessarily have to then follow that with a fight. Although I feel like it's probably more, more likely than not, right? Given that the Second Inquisition, their sole job is to kill all vampires. But is there perhaps a bigger fish that they would rather spend their limited resources on? Or if you're going Sabat, perhaps there is an elder that they are looking for information on. Well, I guess in both instances, is there someone they would rather kill than your players? And coming face to face with those opposing ideologies and talking with the people that vehemently believe those things is often much more dramatic than playing out a fisticuffs fight with them. Like, you go, they're gonna try and stake you. That can be really cool, but it's a lot slower paced, especially in Vampire, where the combat sucks. And honestly, I knew that Inquisition wouldn't do it, but for, this is an aside, I, for the Hunter game, I really hope they fix combat for that game because you're going to be fighting monsters. Anyway, Hunter the Reckoning is an entire other video and we'll get onto that later. The drama there is that you have to get something or survive something like an interrogation perhaps. If they're getting down to it doesn't think that your players are strong enough and doesn't think your players are useful enough unless they convince them otherwise which is a really horrifying position to be in it's and obviously if you discuss all this with your players it can get pretty tense i love being able to put my players in situations like that but let's move on to the antagonists themselves the things and the creatures and the vampires and the hunters 
that your players will be actually up against. I'm going to show you some of the Second Inquisition book. If you are a GM and you really very quickly need a stat block because the players are like, ooh, who's that in the corner? And your, your notes say, it's an Inquisition guy. You can jump into this book and go, uh, it's this Inquisition guy and he has this dice pool. Uh, it's really useful. And one of the things in the vampire game that I've been asked recently was how do you balance stuff? Well, it's really difficult. It is a very difficult game to balance because there's no uh, CR rate, con like combat rating. There's no level of like abilities. Every level you're not going to get combat stuff. When you spend XP, you're not always going to get social stuff or mental stuff or resistance to powers or powers that make you more able to manipulate the situation. I am willing to be wrong. I'm, as always, when I make these videos, I adore people in the comments going, actually, I used this thing and it was really good. My players loved it. Brilliant. I would love to hear how you've used some of these things in your games. But from, from my perspective, the likelihood that I will use these is quite low because when I am creating someone for the players to fight against, normally what they need is an objective, possibly a weakness, potentially an opinion on the players. So building that relationship map with the enemies included and whether the players know of them or not, the two opinions going either way in that relationship map is much more important to me. What I do find useful in these lists is the MOs, the general way that these kind of characters will work. They kind of repeat themselves in the uh, Second Inquisition list, much less in the Sabbat book, but each of these stat blocks describe, mostly at the top here, which is pretty cool, what these characters do to the players, not how they have, like their coffee or, you know, the kind of places they hang out, which is useful. No, the Path of Cain tracker is someone that will hunt your players down and the specific way they do that with like uh, these massive dogs is much more terrifying and much more dramatic and, and useful when you're like imagining a scene where your players are being chased. In the Sabbat book, they do that really well. And in the SI book, it's less clear and useful. There's only so many variations of big man with gun that kicks down your door you can create. They have some magic stuff going on in here, and the Faithful and the Flagellant are two of my favorites, because obviously some of the people that want to see vampires ended for all eternity are the Society of Leopold, a Catholic Vatican-backed group that is part of the kind of Second Inquisition um, uh, cabal, who so strongly believe in, well, some of them, that their faith gives them supernatural powers, or at least protects them from evil things, like having extra special uh, defenses against uh, oblivion powers that use the darkness and, you know, the abyss. Which, you know, if you're believing in heaven, that seems like a pretty polar opposite, which is a cool concept that they've introduced in this book. But let's quickly come back, because I'm going to review some of the things that they seem to have introduced in the SI book. The Second Inquisition book has some really, what would seem like cool ideas in this special bit, because obviously your players have what amount to magical powers, right? With their disciplines and stuff. Mortals, normal humans don't have that. And I see that obviously they need some advantage to be able to take on powerful vampires. And I don't know if they need that, but they've tried with these kind of specials for each of the different uh, uh, stat blocks. They've created a special list here. 
and some of these can be really cool, like the gentrifier getting extra dice against oblivion and the aggravated damage for being bitten. But in the gentrifier's case, there seems to be this concept in a lot of them that once a week or once per month, they do a roll. And I, I, well, I don't like that. First off, the time frequency thing. I'm sure every GM knows the first thing to go in a campaign is the concept of time, because that's wibbly wobbly, things happening compressed and extended periods of time over the amount of sessions. That goes out the window real quick, especially in my games. But the players, they don't operate on weekly time schedules in-game, or monthly, or I was being generous, I would say a lot of the time, every night, you do a rouse check. So I guess every single night definitely counts as a uh, thing to track. But you don't, you know, have time skips of varying degrees for either going back in time or going forward in time to visit various scenes. And a lot of these specials do things like take resources away from the player with various time intervals. So that's not going to work in my game at the very least. So, you know, at the at the worst, I would just finagle a, a kind of Jeremy Baramy time scheme of whenever I want to do this, I would do it. However, these roles that the the gentrifier is supposedly doing to remove some parts of these resources the players have happen kind of opposed to the players dice rolls but very often it feels like this kind of abstracted level which vampire doesn't really have i've seen kind of faction level stuff that people do in for instance blades in the dark there's like a faction turn where outside of the heist you go and you like rest your character or get a resource that you need for a future heist or something to improve your 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 den or whatever it's called but that's not something i understand exists in the vampire rules these roles that the mysterious gentrifier is doing like how do you approach that are you like the Inquisition is doing a role against you. I'm not saying it's impossible to incorporate, but the way that I play Vampire a lot of the time, if people have seen me GM or play in a vampire game, those kind of background elements very rarely come to the front. And just out of the blue, asking your players, roll your, you know, uh, domain stats versus this mysterious di dice pool I'm go gonna do is not exciting um, when either they don't know what's going on or not exciting uh, the possibility of the players losing things, which doesn't make much sense when you're like, it's a horror game. What? You're gonna lose stuff. Like, take things away from your players. And I'm not saying don't take things away from your players, but if you want to incentivize your players to work against something, or uh, achieve something, uh, the stick does not work as well as the carrot, is all I'm saying here. This this meta level of, of gameplay outside of a player inhabiting their character is not how I do things. So I'm interested to know if other people will be doing that and if they have done that. I definitely, like I say, have done meta level gameplay and in fact I'm building a game that's very much like that right now. But that is like a focus. This is not uh, a regular feature of Vampire that I encounter. So will I use the ideas of the, the gentrifier and uh, the other uh, people to like get rid of retainers and money and, uh, you know, have the players watch as various people they know and recognize disappear, that kind of thing, uh, having the enemy learn things about them? Absolutely. The enemy does not need a dice roll to do that, in my opinion. So, I mean, rule of fire if you want, but it's too much for me. Uh, normally, normally I complain when things don't have rules. Like, the sabbat is a bit light on that. There's no too many rolls for uh, the rituals that they have. 
but it does give you a full structure of the different elements to a ritual and it does give you the different places and ways you can incorporate player characters into those rituals in you know painful ways like they get caught by the sabbat and now they have to uh you know do a trial by fire because the sabbat are like if you if you walk over this fire without without freaking out, we'll let you go. You're you're cool. You'll be cool. You'll be one of us then. You can join us if you really want. Whether or not they keep their word, that's up to you. And then you know, uh, if you know the basic rules of vampire, you can very easily go. The player needs to roll this, or they need to uh, use the rules from one of these powers, or something like that. Now, one of the things that these books can provide you is law juicy juicy law and i think that overall these books each characterize for instance the sabbat as changed from before and now that they have been gutted by the second inquisition because of their extremely overt ways of using their powers and waging war they have been basically burnt to a cinder and uh, have had to rebuild themselves and their philosophies to include ways of hiding themselves cleaning up uh, but also continuing to focus on the true enemy and the freedom that they really desire and uh, i i really love the characterization of them obviously uh, the Sabbat right here, this art is awesome, by the way. I never expected the Sabbat to be quite so fashionable. And a kind of mesh golf jumper, uh, I didn't expect to see on anyone other than some kind of old hairy fat man. But it works. Gotta give it to the Sabbat. They look fucking great. Anyway, this entire Gehenna war of theirs, this eternal struggle to defeat the ancient masters before they rise up and tear them all apart whether it is true how much of it is true what the sabbat have actually managed to achieve is laid out for you in varying levels of whatever is true in your campaign is true over overall for what 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 you need it to be for your players to have fun and they do that by giving you a history of how they started, how they mean to go on, and what changed. And obviously this pits them against the Anarchs and the Camarilla in various horrible ways and gives them ways to infiltrate cities and reasons to keep quiet and various basically characterizations of their operations and slowly tempting various younger vampires into uh, seductive ways of using blood and seeing themselves as superior and yeah you know putting them through some sort of meme pipeline but whether they're deluded whether they're cult-like and possibly even right but doing horrific things to justify their ends and and the, the various things they want to achieve they will come into a city cause chaos cause problems and achieve a very specific goal that your players may not understand and i think having a sabbat like that is very interesting i one thing i would really love to do at some point is have a sabbat that go a uh, pack uh, go into a city and uh, like start to pick people off but when the players meet them like they're entirely alien they don't even speak with language that the players can recognize it's all like clicks and grunts and tapping each other and like these horrible like if you've seen the uh the bit in oh god what's the oscar isaac film where he's a pr programmer ex machina thank you google uh the bit where the two robots are like tapping each other and to communicate and like tell each other what to do scary to me and i would love to do that to my players and have like monstrous bestial elements like woven in with that with unpredictable enemies where you don't know their powers you don't know their clan it doesn't even matter what do they want no one knows but they're coming in here they're tearing through and if you don't figure it out they're gonna leave and have 
something horrible and leave bodies and vampires with no master in their wake. All of this, like I say, absolute chaos. I would love to do that. In both of these books, I'm a little disappointed about the lack of in-depth information on cities. Uh, while it, it profiles like Mexico and Brazil, uh, and, and Russia and the Baltics and places that you will definitely find lots of Sabat. It's got some really cool uh, uh, fiction in here from their perspectives about all of these different situations. I, I kind of wish they'd uh, fleshed it out a little bit more. And likewise with individual characters, they give little notable paragraphs on, you know, where people that you might have heard of from vampire lore in previous editions, like Lucita de Aragon. There's a mention of Sasha Vykos, I think, somewhere in here, but it's not, there's no big profiles on characters that you can use. This is more, or both of them are more about giving you the tools to build your own, which very cool in some regards for me i i wanted more about individual characters and these paragraphs are all that we get there's a similar couple of pages about you know notable thin bloods and uh, captains in the inquisition and they're, they're probably a good place to start if you're like looking for inspiration for a character to fit somewhere in your campaign now that i've characterized the lauren sabat book let's move on to the Inquisition. This will be really quick because there's no fucking law in here. And I don't... Whatever problems I had with Sabat are double with the Inquisition book. There's a soup of three letter, four letter organizations in here that I cannot keep straight in my head because there's like 50 of them. And they're all profiled in this book about where they are. Here we go, fire teams. And this would have been the most useful part of the book, except that it's, well, I mean, a wise person once said, evil is boring. Uh, unfortunately, these char the, these organizations are both evil and boring. I am not inspired by any of these. There's lots of them. And I ultimately don't see a difference between most. I think it would have been cool to have a, and I think it does this a little bit, a difference in approach from country to country. I think they've characterized those quite well. So for instance, First Light in the USA is a mixture of NSA, very, like huge militarized police presence. They have lots of people, resources, and hardware to rely on and you know agents with huge uh, basically in, uh, espionage industries behind them whereas in england they have much less resources but they have had a very successful operation in london which you can read all about in the fall of london book which is okay uh, mostly they ha didn't expand upon the really cool bits like these organizations there is no big character there's no true hooks for stories in them that i find it is nice in a book that i think quite rightly shows all of these different uh, coalitions to together as a monolithic existential threat to the existence of vampires. They have knowledge, technology, and so many things on vampires that they can effectively build their, their way very slowly to the end of all vampire kind unless vampires change what they're doing, right? And the cool bit in these profiles is these pressure points, the sly weaknesses that they have. For instance, the UK group are, you know, riding high not very influential but you know some people are looking at what they did in london as like eradicating it and slapping on a kind of clean zone sticker and going don't look too closely no vampires in london great job everyone and every now and again like some of their sensors go dark and they won't report it and if they do they do like a full clean sweep and make sure none of that get gets out so you know they can keep that win that is so close to the morale of the organization. There are some really cool gems in here like that, but it does it's not expanded upon enough. I can't 
use all of these things very widely. Like, I could definitely use that as a story hook, but, like, it's kind of small and, like, at an organizational level. Like, uh, you would have to have... Uh, and I guess you often would have different organizations working together, you know, building friction between the two. Maybe the vampires find a uh, one of these pressure points that's so useful and pushing the way through. But I don't find them characterful. And like I say, everything has a three or four letter number uh, acronym for it that I cannot remember. My brain doesn't work that way. I, I can just about remember that GRU is the Russian one because it's got RU in it. Little, little fun tidbit uh, for those looking for previous vampire lore is the Arcanum and their shadowy contact organization, which they feed the uh, the Inquisition through, is the Newberg Group, which I kind of hope we get expanded upon in any other book because it's not in this one. I think, honestly, the most interesting one for me, which I didn't expect, is the Society of St. Leopold, because even though they're like, vampires are evil, they're against God, burn them! And, you know, that's fun to have in an antagonist sometimes. Also, sometimes they bend the rules for penitent vampires who may or may not truly believe what they are... Uh, you know, getting told to do, to rat out their friends and choosing between life, death, and this kind of uh, traitorous existence within a, an Inquisition team. But yeah, I, I really like that aspect of it, but there's not a lot of that in this book. Likewise, if you are looking for cool shit for your players to uh, fight against, the Inquisition book is full of amazing gadgets and... Uh, like ancient artifact things unique things I love there's a little hint to bloodlines in here in the Enochian sarcophagus and it's brilliant there's even some thin blood alchemy in here for the thin bloods that have turn coated against the vampires that have previously oppressed them that very cool like I say not enough of it for my liking sort of understandably there's not a lot of powers other than that nothing for your players uh, to use or your enemies to use which makes sense i kind of wish they maybe made more true faith stuff as it is there's like a holy ground rule where like if you're a true faith person and you're standing on holy ground it buffs you basically not that interesting unfortunately so to summarize what do i think of the sabbat book i think it's really good if you are looking to uh, build a story with some very select kind of plug and play elements like the Cathari seducer who will, you know, plug into any story and tempt the players like if they're anarchs with the insidious ideas and twisting their values towards Sabbat versions of whatever they consider to be freedom or anything like that. and. Yeah, very cool. It's got some powers that you can use. It's got some templates that you can build any story off of. And overall, I would recommend it for a, more stories based around uh, bestial and, and vampiric drama around the player's humanity and the kind of horrible, like, this is what you could become, you monster kind of, kind of stories. It's really, really fascinating. On the other hand, Second Inquisition book, I cannot fully recommend it because there's, I think I said it, a full 70 pages of stat blocks, which I'm not going to use. The last, like, 40 pages of that book, really useful for building a story around, uh, like I say, resisting an occupation of like hunter police sort of thing, or um, an initial raid into a city and trying to decide who to save and who to rat out, or if your players should even uh, turn to the Inquisition side of things, or perhaps they will convince other vampires that maybe there is some way to live in mortal society that doesn't trigger the Inquisition to attack them 
Or maybe they can find a way to turn the Inquisition on itself and dismantle it. Although, as likely as that seems, who knows what happens in the fantasy of your game. That stuff is all in there, but it is not expanded upon enough and it doesn't have enough fresh ideas that I haven't already thought of about, you know, Inquisition metal-clad officers busting into places and all the ways that they may or may not hate vampires and all the way that ways that they may or may not be bribed or corrupt or, you know, blackmailed into working against or being a mole in their own organizations as dangerous as that is for vampires. Yeah, it's it doesn't feel particularly fresh. In, in my opinion, and like layout wise, like I say, back half, back 40 pages, incredible. And I love them for all of the story setting stuff they have. I don't know why it wasn't at the front of the book. There's like 10 pages at the front of the Inquisition book that is just really in very vague words goes over sort of what the Inquisition is and does, that they hate vampires and think they should all burn, and then it goes straight into the, that stat block. It's backwards. This book is backwards. If you think you're going to get use out of that, if you're like really looking for help with uh, Inquisition and putting them in your, in your tales, maybe get it. Maybe read a, the demo of it, the free PDF that you can get. Honestly, yes. That is my feelings on it. It's not a perfect book and not an essential part of your V5 collection, in my opinion. But if you disagree with me, I would love to hear why in the comments um, for Sabat or that, or if you have any questions about uh, how to create chronicles. People have asked me that in the comments, so perhaps I will make some videos on uh, player and GM assistance in the near future. But until next time, here you can find my absolutely incredible Patreon patrons, so thank you for their support, and until next time, goodbye.